So let's build on this concept of diffusion of virions in droplets to understand how there we would expect a size-dependent infectivity of virions in different sized droplets. So an important concept in epidemiology that we will come to later is the infectivity, uh, which is the probability uh, that if a virion is transferred that it actually causes an infection in the host. That can be further broken down into a product of two probabilities. The first is that if the virus has escaped from the droplet, it actually causes an infection. Um, and that's perhaps something which is roughly constant and has to do with the physiology uh, of, the, of the host. Um, but then there is the escape of the, of the virion from the droplet. And as we've already discussed, that's a strongly size dependent quantity. And from very large droplets, it's very difficult in a mucus droplet, especially for the virion to diffuse out in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And in fact, uh, virions are typically uh, found to have a period of deactivation where after a certain amount of time, they are no longer viable and able to uh, uh, to, to basically cause further infection. And so if we assume there's a certain time T or tau V for the virus deactivation, then we can ask ourselves if the virus has had a chance to escape or not as a function of size. So basically to solve this problem, um, we think of this, the droplet here, and we actually want to solve a diffusion problem where C here is, is the sort of concentration of viruses um, in the domain. D is the diffusivity of the viruses, and this is the, diff the, the diff a partial much equation in the sphere, which is uh, diff the diffusion equation. And our boundary conditions are that C of R and zero, the initial condition is zero, and then uh, the, um, at R and T, it's going to be one. So basically what we're imagining here is that we're trying to figure out the C will be the concentration of viruses that has left the system, actually. So, um, so what we have is if we look as a function of the radius, so the radius of this thing is R, capital R. So in, in that distance, we have this, what I'm calling concentration here is just going to uh, jump up to one, and then it's going to kind of diffuse inward like this. Okay, And then eventually, uh, the final state is that it's entirely uh, basically one everywhere, and that's when basically the probability of removal has kind of hit every part of the drop and all of the virus has been removed. So the C is sort of a time-dependent uh, sort of a fraction of the, uh, of the virus or the virions in the droplet which have been removed at time uh, t. So this spherical diffusion equation can be solved uh, analytically in various ways, but there's not a simple closed form solution to this problem. And what we're really interested in here is just a, a rough approximation of what the solution might look like. So let's pull out uh, an approximation for this. So I'll sketch um, the, the droplet again here. Now at early times when uh, there hasn't been a chance uh, for the viruses, the variants to diffuse very far, then only those which are close to the boundary actually have a chance of leaving. That's this initial uh, boundary layer that I sketched here, which is kind of working its way in. So why don't we sketch such a region and give that a distance delta, which is the sort of boundary layer thickness. So basically this outer annulus has been sort of, it is, is really where variants have had a chance to leave, and that's where C uh, is jumping uh, to one. And from if this were just a plane with a semi-infinite diffusion towards the center, so in other words, you have the, the, this delta is much less than R, capital R, the radius, then it's almost like diffusion from a planar source, and then we actually know that uh, this distance uh, is well approximated by square root of 2 dt. So that just comes from solving the diffusion equation in one dimension and leads to that kind of scaling of the diffusion layer thickness. So that's this uh, sort of the, the thickness of this blue region as, as it goes that way is, is, is delta and it scales as uh, it's approximated by square root of 2 dt. And now let's ask ourselves then what is um, this uh, concentration here? Well, what I'm really interested in actually is this escape probability PE and that's going to be the integral of C uh, dV over the volume. So this is the integral over all the R's that are less than capital R, so basically inside the drop of this concentration field. So that concentration field starts at zero and eventually goes to one. 
and that base is giving me this, uh, this total escape uh, probability. So to calculate this integral of the concentration field, I basically have a domain at the outside here where the con this concentration variable is near, is near one, and a central region where it's sort of C approximately zero, and here you know, C is equal to one on the boundary, this uh, variable I've defined here. So therefore I can write that this uh, PE is uh, roughly speaking, if we think of just what is the volume of that uh, spherical annulus, that would be, um, and relative to the total volume, that would be R cubed minus um, R minus delta cube divided by R cubed. So each of the volumes has a four-thirds pi, which I've canceled off. Uh, so this is basically the volume of the total sphere minus the volume of the inner sphere. So that's just the volume of the shell. And then I normalize it properly here. So this is 1 minus uh, 1 minus delta over r parentheses cubed. And if I now, and I have this expression here, so now I have at least an approximation for what this might look like. Um, we can also further say that, you know, this approximation here was valid, you know, for, for the delta being much less than r. And when that's the case, uh, then I also can say that this quantity is small. So at early times, that's small. And I can expand, all right, this is one minus, and then one minus something cube, where that something is small, is one minus three times that something. That's basically a Taylor expansion. So that when I work this out, the ones cancel, and I get um, three delta over r. So what we find is that this PE, which we're, uh, discuss which we're trying to calculate, <clears throat> has two limits that are kind of easy to calculate. One of them is this 3 delta over R, and if that's our delta, then we get 3 square root of 2 dt uh, times R, and specifically the PE is defined up to a certain time tau V. So I'll now replace T with tau V, because that is my uh, time scale for virus deactivation. And so this would be in the case uh, where uh, this quantity, you know, is basically this ratio here is uh, much less than one. And then in the opposite limit, where sort of this diffusion has completely spanned the particle and it's getting much bigger than R, then this obviously has to tend to one, okay? Now, I can write down a function that kind of makes this transition right about when this thing is of order one, in a variety of ways. Uh, one way we could do that would be to write that PE is approximately given by one minus the exponential of minus this quantity. So minus uh, three square root of two d tau v divided by r. And you can see there we have a um, there's sort of, you could, you could either write this in terms of a time where the critical time is, um, so, so we could write this, just to kind of get a little more insight into it, we could write PE is approximately one minus E to the minus tau V over some kind of time scale, uh, I'll call it tau D for diffusion, where we see here that tau D is R squared over, uh, and then it's, to bring inside the square root, that 3 becomes 9, and then times 2 is 18, so 18d. Now, you may recall from our last calculation, the average first passage time in the sphere calculated exactly was r squared over 15d. So this very simple calculation is clearly giving us you know, roughly the right order of magnitude for that time. But we're actually not interested so much in writing this in terms of time. We'd actually like to write it in terms of radius. So I can also write PE is 1 minus e to the minus r, I call it maybe rd for diffusion over r, where rd is basically all this stuff, 3 root 2 d tau v, okay? So this is maybe another useful way to write that. And what does this function look like as a function of r? This one right here. So maybe if I sketch that, I'll, I'll, I'll look at this a little bit more carefully. Let's plot this. So as a function of r, here is um, this rd, this sort of typical critical size. 
when we are smaller than that critical size, then uh, basically we have that PE, the escape probability, essentially is very close to one, okay? Because then we have, you know, that, that's basically just what we were just arguing, it's this limit right here. But then it's a function that when it gets much larger than RD, then it decays, as we suggested here, as sort of one over R. So it's actually a fairly slow decay, um, uh, you know, in the long run. So basically there's this, this limit here. And I just wanted to get to this picture, just to point out that even though there are obviously physiological characteristics having to do with um, the way that a, a virion would actually get into a host cell and whether they would get infected, but a lot of those properties are, are, should be independent of the delivery of the virion in a droplet. It's really more once the virion gets out, there's some kind of process. But what this calculation shows is that we would expect a fairly strong dependence of the infectivity on the size of the droplet. And in particular, if we calculate this RD, we have some idea that sort of droplets that are smaller than that are highly infectious because every virion in those droplets can get out and infect the host cell. Whereas if the, the virus is, uh, the droplet is much bigger than that, then you have this kind of problem where there's kind of a dead region in the middle and those virions are not gonna be able to get out in a reasonable amount of time, uh, which is set by this tau V. So for example, tau V for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the coronavirus, is estimated to be anywhere from one hour. There was one study in aerosol droplets finding that kind of decay but another study found that after 16 hours, it was still viable, so there's not a, quite a consensus forming yet, but it may be a time on the order of hours, uh, certainly days, uh, over which the, the virion needs to get out of the droplet in order to be uh, able to cause infection. And this calculation shows you that as a result, you would expect a size-dependent uh, diffusivity, or excuse me, a size-dependent infectivity, and roughly speaking, if we plug in the numbers, these are the aerosol droplets, and these are the large drops. We've already done that. That was our previous calculation based on this time here, which this, what I'm calling tau d here, which corresponds to this, is also pretty close to what we call tau zero. That was the, well, that was, that was the, the um, longest escape time. Actually, what I called, I think, tau bar, actually, which was um, r squared over 15 d, that was the average escape time. Uh, so basically we've already shown that that average escape time starts to become days or even months uh, when we get to large drops, but for the aerosol droplets, uh, in mucus anyway, this time scale is of order uh, you know, minutes to hours, which is reasonable, and you would expect those to be very infectious droplets.